<sighs> okay. So uh, we ended last hour by kind of agreeing that uh, in this situation it's kind of better to overbook, if you like, or overbuy and buy more than the average due to the kind of uh, asymmetric cost structure here. You would probably expect then that if you have a symmetric distribution but also a symmetric cost structure, meaning that the distance between these three cost elements is the same then then you should perhaps uh, order the average, which is a very simple strategy. We will see this later, I think, in an uh, exercise later on in the course. So th there is some uh, underlying here. But uh, if you think about an airline company, of course, the marginal cost of adding an extra passenger is very small compared to a potential income. So you would expect that airplanes kind of should overbook. The same, of course, in the concert setting. You move the camera. Can you see me? Can you see me, Maria? Yeah. No, you cannot see the whole. The whole uh, head. You can just turn it slightly. <laughs> yeah, this is good. This is event, uh, real event planning, isn't it? <laughs> That's how, what it should Sorry. be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where was I? Yeah, and of course the same if you have a concert. Um, there is a potential to take a fairly high price for the ticket, but there is really no costing adding, putting, uh, filling up an, uh, an empty seat. Okay, so in those cases you would expect a lot of overbooking. But of course there is a there is something behind the mirror here. If you if there's too many people in the room, then you. You can, and if there's an accident, so there is a, it's not straightforward, is it? Yeah. Of course, the ideal situation in the event setting is to have no capacity constraints, kind of have a, a growing, a growing uh, concert hall. That is the ideal situation. And of course, that's perhaps the reason why you kind of use a lot of football stadiums and stuff to have a big concert, because you have a kind of very flexible uh, seating capacity where you can kind of fill up with a lot of people and if you get a high demand then you can kind of still kind of fill people in but it, it's there is some problems here because uh, most people who attend the concert they have some demands on both comfort as well as distance to the scene and if the distance is too far away then you can of course compensate with some large screen TVs but still it's really not the same so you, then you must expect kind of more price differentiation on the tickets and all these kind of stuff which we will we will discuss when we when we move on to the second part of the course. But now we want to look at uh, our friend Mac, who is uh, struggling with uh, how many magazines or newspapers or whatever he wants to buy. Um, oh, let me move on here. Okay, uh, of course, uh, now we move to the newsboy, or it's often also called news vendor. I assume that this boy is kind of uh, gender problematic, so they introduced this vendor instead. That's a kind of neutral term. Model. The original name was the newsboy. Of course, in the old days, there were no news girls. Okay, so in the f we can kind of look at two different situations. Either our Q, this is our ordered quantity, is larger than the demand, which is X. So Q is ordered quantity and X is demand. And X is now assumed, as we have talked about, uncertain. Okay. To be more specific, it's possible to describe this through some kind of probabilistic mechanism. O the other way around, I and then the demand turns out to be larger than what we order. Here we kind of overbook, here we underbook. Now this situation, Q exactly equal to X, 
is kind of so improbable and if we have a kind of continuous dis probability di distribution we can never hit exactly can we if I would like to find the probability that I measure the length of a certain person to be 1.786 meters I will never find that person will I because if I measure all persons very tight there will always be something behind this in decimals okay so you will never kind of hit exactly when you have a, a, a continuous distribution so we don't really need to care about this midpoint so we don't need to need to to put the equal sign under any of these ones we can look at either we either we buy more than we sell or we could have sold more than we buy that's the two situations we look at we assume further further this f of x the probability density o demand is given okay this is something which, which we know okay, we have to have that as data to our model is known we also have to know these cost elements we discussed and now we put some letters on, on them and to simplify we use CO the cost of overbooking and CU as the cost of underbooking if you recall our example we had three cost elements okay but we we calculated these costs didn't we by taking 75 minus 115 minus 10 to kind of get these over and under booking costs so basically we kind of have three cost elements underlying here the buying price the selling price and the salvage price which is often referred to now we have described our problem okay this is what we have we have given a density to describe how demand performs or behaves uh, uh, probabilistically and we have these two cost elements and of course we have identified two different situations uh, when we order what we're aiming to do now is to formulate some kind of measure of total costs okay as we do in logistics and of course we want to minimize that the problem now is that we don't know the total costs now do we because the total cost is first defined when we have observed our demand and we have to make our decision before we know the demand of course if we knew if we knew the demand then we would order it then we didn't have a problem so the problem here is kind of described by the fact that we do not know the demand now we have to make a decision before we know the demand and in that case the consequence of that is of course that we do not we cannot construct an expression which gives us the cost of tomorrow today what we however can do is to look at the average cost or the expected cost and we could minimize that meaning that if we are kind of repeating this kind of situation kind of uh, uh, this is kind of a typical situation this new spot here does this every day so in the long run minimizing the average or expected cost may be a sensible strategy of course if our newsboy is very afraid of having too little papers or too many papers we can look at more complex objectives here we can kind of introduce the variance as some kind of objective minimizing the variance for instance trying to to uh, to to avoid all kind of extreme outcomes weighing the expected value with the variance so there's a lot of options here we can, can kind of put constraints in the model saying that we would, with a certain probability we would at least be able to sell so many papers and that kind of stuff okay but uh, in the simplest case and what is typical in most stochastic optimization we kind of stick to the expected value or the average cost so we minimize the expected cost then what we need now is to find an expression for the expected cost after we have constructed that expression then we can use our toolbox to optimize on that one so it's kind of 
from this point on after final finding this expected cost uh, we are kind of at the same situation as just been with these other models we have looked at the only difference now is that this is a so-called stochastic optimization problem as opposed to the, the deterministic ones we have looked at and the, the major difference here is related to kind of formulating understanding and kind of finding an objective which kind of captures uh, this uncertainty reasonably so if we stick with minimizing and then often we do it like this we just write an e and then we put the variable inside so this means expected cost okay to shorthand notation hello Jonas you're talking about the objective now yeah just continue yeah please thank you Now, if you recall from the last hour, we said that we can compute an expected value. And we assume now that we have a continuous distribution. That's kind of signaled by, by, by writing f of x here. If it had been a discrete one, we could we'd typically write it something like this, p i o x i. Okay? That would be the discrete analog to the continuous one. And then we have a continuous distribution to, to compute the expected value. We, we said last hour that then we have to do a construction like this. This is the outcome variable. Okay? This kind of tells us what we get. Okay? This is what we get in different situations. This is the corresponding probability. And of course, when it's continuous, this kind of what we get is kind of moving a little bit by little bit by little bit. So we need to kind of formulate here what we get in these two different situations. That is the idea. What do we really get here? And we're interested in looking at this cost-wise. So what kind of cost do we get? What kind of cost do we get if we overbook? Okay. So, let me take this out. Yeah, you can stick. So let's take each of the situations in sequence. So let's start with the situation where <coughs> we order more than the actual demand. In that case, our integral and these integrals, we kind of put limits on them to sign that we move from this point to another point. Recall that we kind of interpreted this by a and b here so this refers to a and this refers to b and we start with zero now we move up to q and then we get this overbooking cost times q minus x now q minus x is positive here isn't it as we move along up upwards we we kind of always have more available which we have bought than the actual demand and we have to multiply with our overbooking cost to find the, the cost in each little time step. And then we sum or integrate together to find the expected value. And of course we have to multiply this with the probability density and put dx to, to kind of keep the, keep the notation correct. In the second situation, then we move from q and upwards. And now we have kind of made an implicit assumption here that our space here starts at zero and ends at infinity. In other cases we could start at minus infinity and at, and at infinity or it could be a given value here. Because we know that we will always sell more than something if there is a certain contractual agreement or something. So these kind of values here, kind of will these two will depend on the situation we look at. But we are always going the way through this Q here when we formulate it. And then it's the underbooking cost and of course we have to turn this around now because now our demanded quantity is always bigger than what we have bought. So this is the expression for the expected cost. So if we add, we can find the expected cost now by taking one and add two to it. This one plus this one 
produces the expected cost in this situation. So now we have an expression for the expected cost. And the next step then would be to take the first derivative of this function with respect to our variable, which is q equated to zero and solve. The problem here is that q is a variable in the integral. It's kind of part of our integral here. And then we need some special rules to to perform this differentiation and that is a rule that you probably have not seen before okay but let us uh, kind of sum up you want to minimize this one and in order to do that we take the first order derivative of our expected cost and equate that to zero to solve just in the same way as we did when uh, we looked at the uh, this EOQ simple model. <coughs> but as I said, we need some more mathematical knowledge, unfortunately, to, to achieve that result. Now I'm a bit unsure, okay? Let's see. Okay, I, I can at least write up the rule for you, okay? So you can see what it looks like. Okay. So in order to do this, we need to use, use something which is commonly referred to as Leibniz rule. And let me write down Leibniz rule for you. It's discussed in Appendix 5a in the textbook. So it's, it's there, okay? And it looks like this. If we want to take the derivative with respect to a certain variable, say y, or integral which contains some kind of expressions involving this y, it's here kind of named by a1 of y, this is a function of y, a2 of y, another possible function of y, and then we have some kind of function inside here, which also could contain y, and there is an integral related to the x. If you recall our expression, we had a q up here, okay? So that kind of refers to this y, which is what we want to take the derivative with respect to. And there was some kind of q expressions inside here as well. There was also an x expression, which kind of was the, the, the probabilistic mechanism here. It turns out, after uh, some heavy proofs, that uh, it could be written as follows, as the integral, so we kind of stick with an integral here, from a1 of y up to a2 of y, and then we have to take the partial derivative here, of this h of x y, with respect to y, and then we have to add some notions involving this h function, h, and we should insert a2 of y and y. So we should insert, insert this one for the x here and keep the y here. And we should multiply with a2 prime, which is the derivative of a with respect, a2 with respect to y. And we should subtract the similar kind of pattern where we put in a1. So this is the kind of rule we have to apply in this situation to actually find this derivative. So you see it's slightly more involved than what we're used to. I don't think I will go through everything here, okay, because this is kind of takes a lot of time. But let's just see, uh, okay, in this situation our Q is kind of linked to Y as we said and x is linked to x, okay? Now we have to kind of look into our expression and try to decode what things are. And this h of x, y, 
of course corresponds to what we have in the integral side. And we have kind of two expressions here. So either we have to put it together or take it one by one. I think if you want to do this, you should do it one by one. So this h of x, y in the first case equals q minus x times f of x. And so we do, we kind of apply this Leibniz rule in each of the two situations, one and two, as we formulated it. And in the second case, we have a different one, h of x, y, is then turned around and is x minus q times f of x. At least now we are in a situation where we can do it, okay, because we can find the derivative with respect to y of this expression as well as this expression if we substitute y with capital Q. Okay, so then we can solve this expression in this situation as well as in this situation. Our h is given okay, in the first situation and in the second situation. You can put in a2 of y, in one case it was zero, in other case it was capital Q and it was infinity. And of course we run, may run into some problems with infinity. It turns out to be zero actually. So, so then we can kind of use this mechanism and write the solution more or less directly given that we accept that this is a correct expression for performing this differentiation. And uh, I can assure you it is, okay, so don't bother thinking about that. So <coughs> I think we just skip directly to the answer, okay? If you want to really look into this and you run into problems, please, please tell me, okay? I will go through it with you. It's, it's really not that difficult, but it's, there are a few more tricks, okay? So, after doing this, maybe we can, can write up the derivative. Maybe that's a good thing to do. Let me think. Okay, we can uh, do it partly, okay? So after applying this rule, I think I'll just finish this now, okay? And then we probably stop for today. I put some dots here to indicate that there is something we don't show here. Actually applying this rule and then we end up with our expected cost and we should perhaps put q in here you know, to, to say that this is a function of q and this is the derivative. So we have found the derivative and it turns out to be this expression co times the integral from 0 to q o1 times f of x dx plus cu times the integral from q to infinity o minus 1 times f of x dx. It, you see there's a lot of this which actually vanishes. There's a lot of zeros here which kind of evaporates so we end up with a, an expression which basically involves just taking the derivatives under the integral sign. You see this one comes from a positive q in one of the first one and this minus one comes from a negative q in this, this two part. So all this h put into stuff kind of vanishes. Okay, now we have to do a little trick, trick in here. Uh, we know, we know by definition that if we integra integrate our whole density over, over the whole area which is defined it should equal 1, shouldn't it? We have been discussing this, this is kind of the unity the unity demand for probability densities. Of course we can split this term into two parts, can't we? We can integrate it from 0 to q, the same one, and then we can move on from q up to infinity. This is just kind of taking a sum 
Uh, you can sum it all, you can split it in two parts, where you sum up to a certain point and keep on summing after that. So it, it works in the same manner. The reason why we're kind of fiddling with this is that, you see, we have different limits on these two integrals. And we want to kind of introduce just one to make it kind of easier. That is the reason. So if we, if we kind of write this one slightly different, we can, for instance, say that if we stick with this one on the left-hand side, we can move that one to the right-hand side, and we end up with the integral from q to infinity of f of x dx equals 1 minus this one. Of course, this part could then be substituted for this part, couldn't it? There is a minus 1, we can take that out, it doesn't matter, so we can kind of get both integrals on the same measure, so to speak, from 0 to q, to q. It will be clear why we do this, okay? In the old days, when we were teaching, the students knew this, okay? So, but no, today they don't, for some, some weird reason. Okay, so our expected derivative cost as a function of q then becomes c o and I don't a few I skip just a little one here okay now both elements You probably see that we get a single CU here, because we have a CU there, and we kind of put in 1 minus. So we, when we multiply, we get a CU, which kind of stands by itself. So we, we end up with kind of three elements in the, the total moving from, and we put in 2 for 1, of course, keeping on, there's 1 plus 2, so there's three elements. And these equations should equal 0. And uh, of course, we have to solve this one now. Well, no, we can kind of put together these two integrals, they are exactly equal. So you probably see now that uh, the solution ends up being mm -hmm. this produces what we're looking for, the final solution, that the integral from 0 to q O f o x dx should equal a kind of ratio here which contains the underbooking cost over the total of the two cost elements. So this is the shorthand notation of the so-called newsboy formula. And you can probably see immediately here now that if, yeah, maybe we can write it slightly differently as well. You recall we introduced this distribution function, which was exactly this expression, and we used the capital F. So alternatively, we can write it like this, F O Q equal to C U over C U plus C O. So this is a probability, isn't it? Depending on which value of Q. And we're kind of searching the, prob the, the, the Q value, which gives a certain probability. So we compute this probability here. And you see here that if CU equals CO, then we get a half here, don't we? You can see that? Yeah. So that means that we're looking for a point in our distribution where the probability is a half. And if it's a symmetric distribution, that point corresponds with the expected value. So that means ordering the expected value. If it's a kind of skewed distribution, we cannot be guaranteed that, because you probably know that, or maybe you don't, <laughs> that if, if our distribution is not symmetric, uh, have you heard about the median? Yeah. The median equals the expected value if it's a symmetric distribution. If it's not, they don't. 
And in that case, you kind of you, you will either over or under book. So there are kind of two things that that must have to be present for kind of ordering the expected value. There must be a symmetry on the cost side. These fraction must be a half, as well as a symmetry structure here. And then it's very simple to solve the newsboy problem. Then it's just ordering the expected value, which is very simple. But if it's a slightly devi deviation, either on the one or the other of these assumptions, then you have to either overbook or underbook to do it optimally. OK. Now the textbook looks at an example. We already have an example, don't we? We have the information we have here. We, we need here, basically. Um, and we should perhaps say one thing more, OK? Now, one way to at of attacking these problems in practice is to assign our data information, which is missing, by the way. Why is that? Uh, yes, to assign this information directly to a probability density or function, if you like. And if we, if we stick to the normal density, then what we're looking for then is to find two values. One value is the average. I think we maybe we didn't compute it. We said that it was close to 12. It's not exactly 12. It's actually 11.73. So x bar, which represents my in the formula of the normal density, is 11.73 in this case. And we could also estimate this s square as 1 over n minus 1 times sum of x i minus this one, x bar squared. And this value turns out to be 4.74 squared. We very often uh, write it like this. You probably know that if we take the square root of this one, it's called the standard deviation. Okay? And we often use an s to demonstrate that it's kind of an estimated or formed based on observations. And then we could say that our f function is distributed, we tend to use this sign here as normal with expected or average 11.73 and a variance or standard deviation of 4.74 square. And this is a kind of pattern you may have seen in other courses. I don't know if you have. You kind of assign values to a normal density. The problem with the normal density and what we're looking for here is to solve this problem of this type. 0, 2q, f o x dx should equal a certain number here. We have the number here, don't we? This one is known here, isn't it? It is 50, 75 minus 25 on top here. 50 again, and this final one here, which is what was it? 15, wasn't it? I think so. This is around 0 0.77. So we can find this probability. So what, it's kind of an awkward equation we're trying to solve here. Because our distribution looks something like this. It might have an average on 0. And here is uh, a certain point, let's call it Q. And what we're looking to is to try to find this Q, which has a probability mass on the left here, which equals 0 0.77. That's what we're trying to do here, okay? So in order to do this mathematically, we have to be able to solve this integral. And unfortunately, this normal density integral is not solvable. So then we have to compute it for different values of Q and construct these tables, as you probably have seen, these normal tables. And if you look, I think, in the back of the book here, there is uh, one of those. Let's see. They are in most uh, logistic books. 
Yeah, maybe. There's a different distribution here, I see. Let's see. There is one on page 755. There you see a normal distribution table. So here they have kind of computed these probabilities for different values along these axes. And then you can just go into the table and pick the, the, the you're looking for this value, so you have to pick the probability and kind of go the opposite way to find, find these, these Q. If you look in the table, you will see that there is a value here of 0 0.7703, which is fairly close to 0 0.77. And that corresponds to a value OQ equal to 0 0.74. There is a problem here with these tables, and they are kind of normalized, as we say. So they do not produce a normal table for all kind of normal distributions. They just pick one. They pick the one where the expected value is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So this is kind of a standard normal table and you have to compute yourself back from this one and into the space you kind of have here. And our expected value was 11.73 and the variance was 4.74. So we have to to actually... yeah. So you see there is no end to all the problems here. Let's see, let's see, okay. I shouldn't fool you here. Now when we normalize, we kind of take the given value, we subtract the expected value and divide by the standard deviation. And if the, this valuation should be equal to a certain value, we can solve this with respect to x, can't we? By multiplying over here, we get x minus my equal to v times sigma. And then we can isolate x on one side, and it's v times sigma plus mi. So when we are looking for a normal distribution, which is not the standard one, which has not an expected value of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, you have to use this formula and enter the value we found in the table into this formula, putting in the correct value. This is the value we found. This is the standard deviation. This is the expected value. And then if we do that in this case, we end up with this one is 11, sorry, maybe we can write it in the right direction, 4.74. That was the standard deviation. We multiplied with the value from the table, which was 0 0.74. 0 0.74, and we add the expected value, which was 11.74. And this turns out to be very close. 15. Okay? So we ended up finding a solution, didn't we? How much to order? We argued when we started that based on the cost structure we should expect to overbook. Overbook here means ordering more than the expected value. 15 is more than 12, although not very much more. Then, of course, you can ask does this really have any practical impact? Why don't maybe this new spot just could have ordered 12? It didn't make really much difference. Of course, it wouldn't. It depends on the cost. There is a little bit of saving involved in doing this, but perhaps not so much as we would like. But of course, if you put, take this kind of structurally easy problem and put it into a more a different kind of setting, it could actually involve large uh, monetary savings. Okay. Now, when we did this, we skipped certain parts, okay? This was this conversion from this ugly formula into the actual derivative. But after that, we kind of did everything, I think, more or less. Now, let us look at a different example, okay? I just keep on now, so we stop when I'm finished, okay? So, let's look at a different example. quick one. Now what I'm going to do now is that I'm, I'm going to change the distribution. Look at a different distribution which is easier to, to calculate. So we actually can see that this can be analytically computed. So we assume 
a uniform distribution. Do you know what a uniform distribution is? Or it's often called a rectangular distribution. A uniform or rectangular distribution is the so-called maximal variance distribution. It means it spreads out, so there is no information basically in it. Okay? It's completely random. Apart from the fact that it starts at the point and then ends at the point. So if we want to kind of simulate the normal distribution here, we should perhaps have something like this, don't you think? We start at zero, there is an average on 12, and it stretches out to 24. And it should have a shape like this then, shouldn't it? So this is an alternative to our normal distribution, which went like this. Here we have a fairly small variance, we are more certain here. In this situation, we are more uncertain. Because here, there you see, there is every kind of outcome here is equally probable. As opposed to here, where it's a small probability, here is a much higher probability. Okay. Okay. Let me take out this image of the normal distribution from the rectangular or uniform distribution and do some small side cal calculations on this one. Now, we don't know this distance here, do we? This is not known. But we can find that easily. Can't we? Because we know that the area under this curve should equal 1, shouldn't it? That's by definition. Okay. So, if we call this x, then we should take x times 24, which is this distance, produces this area, and it should equal 1. So you see x can be solved easily as 1 over 24. So this distance must of course be 1 over 24 if the area of this rectangle should be 1 when this length is 24. And you see that I, I deliberately construct a uniform density which kind of fits to this situation. I have my midpoint here at 12. Okay. Now I can write up my probability density function directly, can't I? My probability density function is zero here. Then it suddenly pops up to 1 24th, keeps like that until that point and pops down onto zero again. So, I f o x is 1 over 24 if x is in the interval from 0 up to 24, isn't it? It's 0 elsewhere. Now this is a complete functional description of my probability density. And of course it's much easier than these expe expe uh, exponential functions and squares and everything. Okay. Now we ended up by stating this formula, didn't we? So we need to find this capital F of Q. In the previous case, with the normal density, we didn't find it. We used a table. Okay. But in this case, the idea is that we can actually find it. Okay? So that is the point. So let's try. Then we take this one out. No, I can take this one out. Maybe we should leave this one. Okay. Or capital F OQ should equal the integral from 0 to Q OF OX DX. F of X is given here. It starts at 0 and it stops hopefully at some Q below this 
24 point, doesn't it? We would never order 24 here. So this Q is typically smaller than 24. So we can write this as the integral from 0 to Q of 1 over 24 dx. f of x is 1 over 24. We don't see any x, so it's a constant, OK? And now we have to really perform integration here, how it's really done, OK? So what we're looking for now is to find a function which has 1 over 24 as its derivative. And that is 1 over 24 times x, isn't it? If I take the derivative of this one, I get the constant back. And then, when we do that, we enter this integrand instead of this one, and then we shift the sign here, keep these ones, and remove the dx. So it looks like this. Because we have to enter the upper bone and the lower bone into this expression, and subtract to find the actual value of the integral. I haven't told you that before, some of you may know, those who didn't know must learn this now, OK? So we should enter the upper bound, 1 over 24. Oh. Sorry. Q instead of x. And then we should subtract the lower bound, 1 over 24, times Zero. Okay, this is very easy, isn't it? So our capital F of Q is turns out to be Q over 24. That is the final answer for the distribution function. And then we can just equate that to our fraction value, which we found previously. It was 0 0.77, wasn't it? So Q divided by 24 should equal 0 0.77. This was the Cu over Cu plus Co in the example. And man, in many cases, when we do optimization, we tend to use a star here, don't we? So to be kind of specific, now it should have been stars for all the Qs here, basically, because this is the result of the optimization. So we find the optimal ordering amount, Q star. Uh, so Q star is hence 24 times 0 0.77. And if we calculate this number, it turns out to be around 18.5. Now, the idea here was to demonstrate two things. The first one is that it's possible, given that the probability structure or density has a nice shape. Then we are able to do the integration and can find an actual expression for this f o q, and then we can solve it analytically. If the distribution is more tricky, we kind of need to use numerical methods or tables, which is kind of the same thing. Uh, which is typical for the normal distributions and a, a whole pile of other distributions. The other aspect we wanted to demonstrate here was that this turns out to produce a difference in the amount of overbooking, doesn't it? We overbook more here. In the previous case, we bought 15. Now we suddenly increase it up to 18.5. Can anybody of you see a reason for this? Are you able to explain what's happening here? Now we move from a fairly certain situation to a more uncertain, don't we? Because the variance of this distribution is much bigger than of the normal distribution. And then it's not so hard to accept, is it, that you will overbook more. You kind of, when you're more uncertain on what happens here, you kind of... Of course, if you're not uncertain at all, you kind of do not overbook at all. Then you, then you pick the, the, the average. So the more uncertain it is, the more you should overbook, given that you overbook. And when we move from a fairly less certain situation to a more uncertain situation, we would overbook more. Okay? So this is, this is kind of reasonable. Okay? So you should expect that. And this is perhaps the maximal overbooking level you would do in this situation. Okay, this concludes my discussion on the new spoil model. What we will do in the next part of the course is, of course, to apply these models in more 
event-like situations where we talk about tickets and spectators and bands and whatever. Okay, so you kind of see because this is a very important model in event planning. It's kind of the the obvious starting point for doing event logistics, both on the res resource input side as well as on the artist side uh, and the booking side and everything. So it's um, it's kind of an, an obvious choice. So, th so that's the reason why we spend a considerable amount of time on discussing this stuff. The problem, of course, is that it kind of uses knowledge which you typically don't have. Okay, you don't you're not f you don't speak integration fluently, and of course. The equation we write up here as the answer is, is a special type of equation. It's called an integral equation. An integral equation is an equation where the variable is on either on bottom or on top of the integral. And th it, th these are especially tricky equations to solve. As you can see here, it didn't work in the normal density case, but it worked here. It's not so hard to imagine because in the discrete case, it's kind of summing up something up to a certain variable and it should be either post typically to some kind of value. This is, this is kind of the situation you end up with in the discrete case, the analog discrete case to this case. And if you look at uh, how it's done, if you look at the discrete situation, we can look at the example here. Because here is an example where you, where you do this discreetly. And it turns out that the discrete demand is it's actually the same function, but it should be larger than or equal to this fraction here. So this is the discrete case. So you kind of try to find the probability which is kind of closest to this one, but on top of it. Okay? And you see here they kind of have produced this FOQ. It's uh, the values here, 0 0.01, it moves up, 5, 6, 7. And we had a value of 0 0.77, didn't we? It's the same as before. It's computed on this fraction. So we need to find a point here now, which is closest to 0 0.77 and still larger than it. That must be that point, wasn't it? 0 0.7885, 41 over 52, <coughs> which corresponds to a value of 15, doesn't it? Yeah. So it, we get the same solution here when they do it discreetly, as when we kind of adapted the normal density directly. So we have a choice here, either to do it like this, or to estimate and use the normal distribution and look into tables. This kind of thing was a different step. Now we suddenly introduced a different distribution, and of course we got a different answer. <coughs> Notice that this is exactly the same order quantity obtained using the normal approximation. So we can kind of think of that as a normal approximation. In this case, we really don't approximate at all, because we use all information we have as it is. Just converting it first to a histogram and then to a probability distribution, and then look it. So, so there are actually two answers to this theory, a discrete, discrete answer and a continuous answer. The only difference is that we take this one out in the continuous case, then we equate it directly. Okay. That was my lesson today. Tomorrow we will discuss scheduling. Then we move back into deterministic optimization and different type of problems. Okay, do you have any questions by the end of the day? No. This was hard to eat, wasn't it? Yeah, I could expect that. That, that was expected. Yeah. Now, of course, you will basically not be tested in your underlying mathematical understanding of this. It's your ability to apply it sensibly in practical situations, which will be a possible examination topic. Okay. Uh, have a nice day. The weather is not so good today. But it has been nice very long now, so we 